<laughs> We're having way too much fun over here for uh, this early, at least in the morning for us. So, but uh, in any event, uh, good morning, welcome. Uh, hi, this is uh, Mobile Web Application uh, Development uh, Jumpstart. Uh, alongside my uh, cohort over here, uh, Jeremy Foster, I am uh, Christopher Harrison. Uh, we're very happy that uh, you could join us uh, this morning, this afternoon, uh, this evening, uh, middle and of the morning. This night. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> wherever it is that, uh, that you happen to be. Devel I think developers um, usually watch training videos at night yes, in the middle of the night. Exactly. So good night to you. Yeah, yeah. So wherever it is that, uh, that you happen to be, uh, welcome uh, to you. Um, let's uh, go ahead and uh, kind of get rolling with uh, introductions. Um, I am, uh, I, I, we're doing this live. Um, I just realized I am going to have to fix something in my system real quick. So if you want to bring up your um, uh, intro slide for me, okay. um, that would be uh, that would be great. So that way I can fix my system while you do your introduction. Okay. But in the meantime, um, yeah, go ahead and uh, do your introduction. Okay. All right. You want to you want to meet me? Uh, yes. Let's meet me. Let's meet me. Let's let's so let me Jeremy. I'm Jeremy Foster. You can find me online at codefoster.com. And on Twitter, at Code Foster. And I like to tweet about all things development. So if you want to kind of keep abreast of at least the things that I know about development and the things that are going on I like to talk about, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, I'm a developer evangelist at Microsoft, and I kind of specialize in the website of life. So there's a lot of different uh, angles in the development world. And I just like the web platform. I always kind of always have. I've, I've been doing it for 20 years, so I, I like it. <laughs> um, I have a, I have a um, podcast called Code Chat that you're welcome to tune into. You can see more about that on codefoster.com slash codechat. And there's also an app that I work on um, along with a number of other contributors called Code Show. And that's how I demonstrate how to make a Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8 client apps using JavaScript. So there's just a couple of the projects that I'm working on. Excellent, excellent. And I will say if you are just trying to get up to speed on, uh, on WinJS and, and doing uh, Windows 8 development, that uh, Code Show is a great place to start. And he didn't actually pay oh, me to, uh, to, to throw that out there, but it is true. So I've actually uh, seen that, uh, played around with it. Um, and in fact, when we did our build event uh, quite a while ago, it seems like a long time uh, since we've presented together. Uh, that was actually what uh, what Jeremy wound up using for yeah. his demos. And yeah. um, I have to say, uh, you should go back and, and, and check that out. So it was um, uh, building blocks, and we did uh, the first day on that, which was a comparison of C Sharp and uh, JavaScript. Um, but in the meantime, let's talk a little bit about me, shall we? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, to make it all about me. Uh, so uh, my name is uh, Christopher Harrison. Uh, I am a content developer here at uh, Microsoft Learning, uh, focused mostly on uh, web technology and uh, Office 365 development. I was an MCT for many, many, many years. Uh, my first real dabbling with computers was uh, the uh, the VIC-20. Father brought ho that home, graduated on to uh, Commodore 64. Uh, best OS ever. I still miss my Commodore 64. Um, these days... It says um, a lot about you, Christopher. Yeah, yeah. It mostly just says I'm old, I think, <laughs> more than anything else. Uh, but in any event, um, these days I uh, spend a lot of my time uh, doing uh, MVAs. I spend my free time uh, running around in uh, circles, uh, literally in fact, you spend a lot figuratively. Of, in fact, you spend a lot of other people's time doing MVAs as well. Yes, this is true. This is true. And in fact, um, perfect segue, uh, one of the things that you'll notice on the break slides uh, is that uh, next week, Jeremy will actually be back with uh, Rachel Appel to do uh, introduction to uh, to jQuery. I'm actually very excited about that MBA. That fills a real big gap that we've had on, uh, on MBA. And I think for a lot of people as well, that a lot of times you'll take a course like this, we'll basically just kind of assume that you know some jQuery. We might spend like 10 minutes talking about it, but we never really get into it. So yeah, you can actually see um, Jeremy and Jeremy. So I am spending a lot of your time uh, yeah. doing MBA. Uh, Jeremy's going to be back here next week, and then Jeremy's going to be back on November 27th for another one that I'm very excited about, customizing identity in, um, in ASP.NET. Now that we've talked about us and we've talked about MVA, let's talk about you and kind of set expectations, uh, the uh, the target audience, and and really what we're going to be uh, focused in on today. Uh, the target really is the beginner, intermediate web developer. So really, those who've maybe done uh, the introduction to MVC, maybe have dabbled uh, around a little bit in uh, PHP, in uh, in Node. 
Node. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, fantastic Node uh, MVA. I'm done with all the shameless plugs now. Uh, but in any event, um, maybe you've just kind of uh, toyed around in a little bit of that, and now you're trying to focus in on targeting all of the different devices that people are going to be connecting to uh, to your sites with. So as a result, we're going to expect that you have some experience with HTML, that you've done some CSS, that you've done some JavaScript, and uh, all right, one more shameless plug. There's a ton of great content available at uh, Microsoft Virtual Academy, where if you haven't already played around uh, with that, you can get in, start learning. And uh, along those lines, you'll also notice that you can get uh, 50 5-0 MVA points. Uh, we actually have over uh, 2 million uh, registered uh, viewers, I should actually, there we go, 2 million uh, registered uh, users. <laughs> two um, registered users? <laughs> uh, 2 million, Neither. there we go, 2 million uh, registered users. <laughs> uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, but uh, in any event, uh, you can go ahead and get uh, your 50 uh, MVA points right there. Now let's get into the outline and start launching on into it. I think we've had enough fun for the morning, um, although the, the entire course is going to be fun. Module one, designing for mobile. This is going to be the opportunity for Jeremy and I to start talking about all the different things that you need to think about in designing in today's day and age. That one of the things that you'll notice is that we are certainly going to be focused on developing mobile web apps. I mean, it is the title after all. But we're also going to get into some of the different things you need to think about when you're focused in on just web development in, in general these days. That actually, if we want to cut to me, I, I, I brought homework, as it were. Um, these are the devices, my little phone, um, one tablet, two tablets. And my Surface, my Surface Pro 1, which I love this thing, by the way. These are all the different devices that I find myself, just me, connecting to the interwebs with on a quasi-regular basis. And so if you're a developer, you know, I remember the good old days of, of Browser Wars and it being Netscape and Internet Explorer, mm -hmm. two whole browsers. Mm -hmm. And boy, we thought life was difficult then, mm -hmm. you know? What I wouldn't give for just two browsers. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> so you have to deal with not just targeting in on, hey, how can we make this look like a, uh, a mobile web app, but also trying to make sure that the site is going to work well, regardless of the type of device. So we are certainly focused in on mobile, and that is going to be 85, 90% of what we're going to be talking about. But we are going to be talking about how some of those design guidelines are going to be applicable into today's web web as well, because after all, touch is pervasive, touch is everywhere. So we'll start to get into all of that in, uh, in module one. In modules two and three, this is where I'm going to get in and start talking about all of the different raw tools that you're going to want at your disposal to start developing for that mobile web. So we'll start off by talking about some of the different things you'll have to think about for the mobile UI, things like images which is a big challenge, uh, talking about how to handle scaling between the different devices and also detecting the type of device and what the device can do. And then we'll roll on into handling touch. We'll take a look at how we could do touch manually by using JavaScript. And then we'll also talk about a couple of libraries that, uh, that are available to us as well. <laughs> And then modules four and five is going to be where Jeremy is going to take over. And I don't know if you want to just go ahead and introduce modules four and five there. Sure. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So in, uh, I'll hide my devices yeah, over here. There you go. <laughs> in modules one through three, Christopher is going to be taking us through a lot of kind of theory and a lot of training, a lot of uh, considerations, how to, a lot of smaller demos. Mm -hmm. And then with four and five, what I'm going to try to do is tie it together into a bit of a practical application. How do you create the server behind an application that we might create? Yep. And then how do you create the client? And what mm -hmm. considerations are there on the play between those? And so we'll actually go into uh, my tool of choice and create the server, and then mm -hmm. go into my tool and frameworks of choice and create the uh, client. 
Nice thing is all this code's been written and it's available to you on GitHub, so we'll show you guys the address and you'll be able to download it all. Absolutely. And uh, just since you said, you know, the, the framework of your choice, I'm going to answer a question that I know we're going to get in the Q&A. And in fact, I'm willing to bet if I looked in right now, we're probably going to be getting asked things like, well, are you guys going to use jQuery mobile? Are you guys going to use Bootstrap? Are you guys going to use fill in other library here? And if not, why not? And I think the simple answer is just because yeah. um, that, you know, one of the things about all the different libraries that are out there is that they all have their own advantages. They all have their own disadvantages and, and people will choose them for all sorts of different reasons. So I don't know that there's necessarily a strong reason as to why we didn't go one direction or another direction. This was just one direction that we decided to go. And that's not to say that there aren't other possibilities out there. And it's not to say that our way is necessarily 100 percent right. and You should always do it our way. And if the library that we're talking about is a well-designed and mm -hmm. open source library, yeah. then, then plugging them in and out and interchanging them with each other and getting them to cooperate with yep. each other is kind of a no-brainer. So yeah. I don't, that's no problem. Yep. Yeah. And actually, one of the demos I know you're, you're going to be doing uh, later on today that you were very excited about um, is uh, actually incorporating one of the libraries I'll be talking about with the library that you're going to be using as well with, uh, with <laughs> Angular. And at some point, so. we'll actually put words on these. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah we're just like teasing everybody. This is the way we're going to make you guys stick around. So, um, and then in uh, module six, we'll get in, take a look at offline data. Uh, we'll talk about caching. We'll talk about uh, storage inside of uh, local and session store session storage, he said in English. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll also get in and take a look at uh, the possibility of uh, geolocation. And then finally, module seven, we're going to take what we've done, uh, or in particular what Jeremy's done, and publish that out to, uh, to Azure. So that way you can see that there really is nothing up our sleeves except for our arms, and that you can actually get in and, uh, and access what we've, uh, what we've done. Yeah, and I've kind of slipped in a little surprise into that one. Um, first of all, the, the publishing to Azure, I'm going to show you a few different different ways that you can publish to Azure, because it's kind of nice to know what your options are. And there are various scenarios that might demand one way over another. Yep. Um, and I've also slipped in there a discussion about the multi-device hybrid app tooling that is available to you in Visual Studio. So kind of seemed like something that needed to fit somewhere in this course. So we dropped it in there. And hopefully, that's some good information. I think that's going to be perfect. Cool. Now, the last uh, big thing that I should mention before we launch on into uh, Module 1 is that a lot of the, uh, the code that we're going to be doing is going to be live, 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 uh, which first of all means something's going to go wrong. <laughs> yeah. Here's our apology. It's going to happen. But second of all is um, we have uh, set up a uh, GitHub here. So github.com, whack geek trainer, whack frayed not, where you can go access all of our slides and access all of our code. And one of the things that you're going to notice about really, I think, both sides of our code is that it's not 100% baked right now. I've got some of my demos pre-baked. I've got some of them par-baked, as it were. Um, and then I've par -baked. got par-baked. Par-baked isn't like part way. Yeah. <laughs> Par baked. I like that. Yeah, we're going to go with more cooking analogies. Yeah. Um, chicken cacciatore will be mentioned at some point today. But um, I've got some of my, uh, my demos like half-baked, and then I've got uh, other ones that I'm going to be doing completely from scratch. So if you're uh, kind of looking around in there, maybe you forked it and you said, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't seem to be completely done. You're right, it's not completely done because we'll be going back in and, and building upon it and then checking it in throughout the day. So basically everything that we do live, live, live here today is going to wind up inside of uh, inside that GitHub repository. So again, that's github.com, whack geek trainer, whack frayed not. So wait, so just so I'm clear, is yeah. this live? This is live. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know if I mentioned sure that, that yeah. but yeah, yeah, it's okay. live. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Now then, let me bring up my slide. Let's get on in to module one here, designing for mobile. Now, before we go anywhere, we should probably establish some rules. And I think when we're talking about designing for mobile, rule one is quite simply, keep it simple. Silly. Silly. Well, yeah, there's other words that you can use there. I, I, I went with silly. Keep it simple, silly. Just keep it nice and straightforward. Because A, it's going to mean less work. And B, it's going to mean less work. That the simpler something is, the less work that I'm going to have to do to make it accessible and work inside of mobile devices. And the simpler I keep it, 
the less I'm gonna have to worry about performance. One of the things that really drives me crazy is when I fire up a site inside of a mobile device and, and it might be geared towards a mobile device and it takes 15, 20 seconds for it to finally finish rendering. Or one of the other things that will frequently happen is you're scrolling down and you're reading text and then all of a sudden it realizes, oh wait, I need to do one more refresh and it pops you back up to the very top again. The easiest way to avoid all of that is just to keep it simple. Really, really simple. And my corollary to this rule too is that just because you know how to do something doesn't mean you should. That just because you know how to add in some little modal dialog box, just because you know how to add in some little spinning widget, doesn't mean you should. That I, I, I always use, and, and there's a particular um, social networking site that's I think still around, but for the most part, no longer. Um, and one of the biggest reasons why I think it wound up going sideways was because of the fact that it let everybody go in and design their own pages however it was that they saw fit. So you had thousands and thousands and thousands of people who weren't web developers that were allowed to start designing their own pages however it was that they saw fit. And so you had MIDI files, and you had um, uh, mouse cursors, and you had all of those different things that were on there. And of course, that just drove people sideways. <laughs> and so as a result, that wound up you know, not working really well. I'm gonna bring that back into our mobile apps. When we're talking about mobile design, if you learn nothing else, in fact, really, this is the main rule. You can stop watching after this. I, please don't. Um, but this is really the main rule. Just because you know how to do something doesn't mean that you should. Just because you have some cool little widget that you want to be able to add doesn't mean that you should. Everything that you have access to, everything that you know how to do is designed for a particular purpose. Make sure that you're using it all well. Or in other words, see also rule number one, keep it simple. All right. So now let's get in and start talking about designing for mobile. So we want to start off by defining this term, this phrase that I'm sure we've all heard by now, which is mobile first. So let's talk about exactly what mobile first is. Let's talk about some different uh, design guidelines, what to do. And then let's also talk a little bit about what not to do. So first of all, what is mobile first? Well, Quite simply, or the too long didn't read version, it's focusing in on the mobile device first. And this is really a shift in the way that most of us do web development. That chances are you've been doing web development for a little while, or chances are your, your primary device is very likely still going to be either a desktop or a laptop. And so chances are that's where your brain is that when you're thinking about, oh, I need to design this web application, you're gonna design based on the device that you're currently using. We all fall into that trap. Stop. Because A, not everybody has some huge monitor that you might be looking at. Not everybody has multiple monitors. Although I really do think every developer needs at least two monitors. Even, just, even when they're mobile. Yeah, yeah, you <laughs> gotta have it. You gotta have it. But um, not everybody has that. that people have smaller screens. And on top of that, people are going to be accessing sites by using mobile devices more and more frequently. And one of the things that you're gonna, you're gonna find as far as a design guideline goes is it's much easier to start with a smaller scale and build up than it is to try and start with the large device and scale it down from there. So start with that mobile device. You know, one of the things that I always like to talk about when we start getting into things like accessibility. So for example, putting uh, your alt attributes on, uh, on images. And people will sometimes go, well, you know, why should I worry about doing that? Well, A, accessibility, but also B, it's one of those good little things that you can do that's gonna have nice little benefits elsewhere. Because if you put in those alt tags, not only is your page now going to be accessible to screen readers and the like, but search engines love that. 
So if you start focusing in right now on designing for that mobile device first, that's actually going to get you a lot of benefits. That um, And there's a slide coming up on this uh, eventually, and I'm um, sort of just getting uh, ahead of myself. Um, but... Um, there's a slide coming up on this, but one of the big things to keep in mind is that even if somebody is working on a laptop, or even if somebody is working on a desktop, there's still a very good chance that they're going to have touch, that this is going to be the, the device that they're going to want to be able to use to go access whatever it is they're looking to access. That I have to admit for me personally, I, I could never quite understand why I would want a touch screen. Hmm. And then I got my Surface. And then all of a sudden, like within a day, I immediately found that I'm just going up to like every screen in the world now and touching it because it's such a natural thing to do, especially when I'm looking for, you know, very simple little menuing or I just need to get rid of a dialog box or something like that, that it's much easier just to go ahead and tap real quick than it is, I think, to reach for the mouse, have to move the mouse and then go ahead and click just real quick, boom, tap and away you go. So if you're if your focus is on that, you're going to have a lot of additional benefits it's beyond just simply the fact that your site's going to look good and work well inside of a uh, inside of a mobile phone. One thing I'd like to interject yeah, right there. Absolutely, please. When somebody is browsing your site on their desktop computer, um, not only might they have touch, and so it's going to act a little bit more like mobile, but they also may have relegated your site in their browser to one edge of their screen. Maybe in Windows, they've snapped it over to the side, or in any any system they might be running, they've resized the window so that it's really small, and now all of a sudden it's acting pretty much like a mobile device. It's acting pretty much like the size of a, of a phone screen. So all of the work that you do, um, yep. putting in, in making your site ready for a small screen is gonna have that advantage even on the larger screens. <laughs> Thank you. So um, let's. I, sorry, I was going through the uh, through the Q and A. There was a couple of things that were making me laugh uh, inside of there. Uh, but in any event, um, let's go ahead and, and start talking a bit more about kind of uh, the the world is changing. So why mobile first? So again, the the, the world has changed. Um, that mobile device growth has far surpassed. Uh, growth of, uh, of the desktop. Uh, I looked around for a chart, and I, I know that at, anecdotally, I've heard this, and, and maybe you know of a site that shows this, um, but at least I couldn't find one. Um, but um, from what I've been able to, to gather, at least anecdotally, that mobile browser usage seems to have surpassed, or at least come very close to, and it will surpass eventually, desktop browser usage. I do have a slide on that. We'll, show, we'll talk about okay, it later. Okay, perfect. Excellent, excellent. So, yeah, so, again, you know, people are going to be using their tablets. People are constantly connected with all sorts of devices, and as a result, they want to be able to use whatever device is in their hand. So if I'm holding my phone, if I'm holding my, my little tablet, and I have an internet connection, that's now the device that I'm going to use to access your, your site. I want that to work. And again, like I mentioned before, it's much easier to scale up rather than scale down. Now, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, Christopher. You know, if I've got a tablet, especially if it's like, you know, maybe an 8-inch tablet, that's going to do a pretty decent job of rendering a desktop site. Or even if I fire up my, my, my phone, my phone is also going to do a decent job of rendering a desktop site that I can go ahead and double tap and it will zoom in on the particular column and then I can go ahead and read and, and away I go from there. So why not just keep doing what we've been doing all this time and just keep going with the desktop devices? Well, partly A, because there's still a lot lost in translation, so to speak, that yes, the desktop site may work on a mobile device on a smaller screen, but it's not going to look near as good as it could. You're also going to have decreased processing power. I mentioned earlier all of those different JavaScript files. You know, we don't want to do a whole lot of heavy processing on a mobile device like we could potentially on a desktop. And then finally, last but not least, limited bandwidth. 
And depending on where you happen to be, this is a much bigger issue than it might be elsewhere. Um, I had, up until about two and a half years ago, unlimited data on my phone. Um, and I loved that. I, I, I was grandfathered in and grandfathered in and grandfathered in. And then finally, I was at uh, a customer site where they didn't have internet access. And I was doing a presentation, and I needed internet access. Well, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. I needed to add tethering. And once I did that, they said, well, now you're changing your data plan. You're going to lose the unlimited. So I had to sacrifice that about two years ago. And I'm still very upset about this. Um, but in any event, um, the, the point there being that when you've got limited bandwidth, all of those huge images and all of those JavaScript files and everything else that you're going to be sending down to, um, uh, to that little mobile phone is going to eat away at that person's data plan. So you want to be a good steward of, the, uh, of your user's bandwidth. Now, this is a little bit of a funny presentation. Because to a certain extent, you may go, mobile web apps. Oh, well, that must mean that Christopher and Jeremy are telling us not to, see, it says it right there. So that must mean that um, the two of us are telling everybody, don't build store apps. That's not at all what we're saying. Not in any way, shape, or form. But there are going to be times when a store app isn't going to be appropriate. Now, one of the things I used to do as an MCT is I used to help run a conference. And so one of the things, of course, when you're roaming around a conference is you want to be able to see, well, you know, what's the agenda? What's the schedule? Well, I've got my phone in my hand. Let me go ahead and pull that up. Well, in theory, that might be perfect to have an app for that. So that way I could just fire up the app and I could see all the, all the agenda. Well, here's the thing. We were doing this really just kind of rushed. And so when we finally decided, hey, let's go ahead and make something available that was going to look really, really good on a mobile device, this is like two years ago, um, we really didn't have the time to go through the approval process for iOS and for Android and for Windows Phone. We needed something up and running right now. So one great advantage of focusing in on just creating a web app as opposed to creating a store app is if you need it up and running right now, then you can do that without having to go through that store approval. You can go that mobile web app route. The second big reason is dealing with compatibility issues. Now, don't get me wrong, we're still going to have browser compatibility issues as we're going to see. But I don't necessarily have to worry about creating code for Windows Phone and then creating fo code for iOS and creating code for Android. And more importantly, I don't have to worry about learning new tools that I can use the skills I already have. And in fact, that's a lot of what you're going to learn today is, you know, click heels three times. You could go home. You have the power all this time. You already have the power to create for mobile. That if you know CSS, if you know JavaScript, if you know HTML, and you know how to go get a couple of libraries, you already have the skills that you need to start creating mobile web apps. All right. Now let's go ahead and start talking a little bit then about some different design guidelines, what to do and what not to do. Here's the first big thing about what not to do. It's really not good to redirect to an M dot. What's an M dot? An M dot in a nutshell, but not even in a nutshell, an M dot <laughs> is where you start with that letter M dot and then whatever your URL happens to be. What does the M stand for? The M stands for mobile. Uh -huh. Yes. So what happens is I fire up my phone, I go to www.superwidget.com or whatever it is that it happens to be, I hit uh, go, and then all of a sudden my browser updates, and now I'm looking at m.superwidget.com. So I've been redirected essentially to a brand new site, a, 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 a second universe, if you will, that was specifically designed for mobile devices. Why not do that? Because it seems so common, it seems very prevalent, and it also seems to a certain extent to be kind of an easier way to do things. Because what I could do is just real quick detect, oh look, you're on a mobile device, and I could go ahead and send you off to the side. 
Well, first of all, it's bad for search engine optimization because of what you've done is you've essentially created another URL. It's also going to take some additional time for you to go in and develop that you're going to notice that you can do an awful lot just with some really good CSS and JavaScript before maybe having to go off and get a library and before maybe having to sit down and redesign everything, that there's actually still quite a bit that you can do. And then finally, last but not least, is your users, if they go to share the link on fill in social media site here, which is exactly what they, you want them to do, it's all going to say m dot and then whatever the rest of the URL is. And I've also seen a lot of times where they've got a little bit of a bad implementation that they put in logic on the regular side, on the www side, to redirect to mobile, but there isn't any logic on the mobile site that if they're using a full desktop browser to redirect back to the main site. So make sure that your URLs are always the same, detect what it is that the device can do, and render accordingly. Now the next big thing that you have to consider is message sizing. Now, we're going to talk a bit more at the macro level about things like JavaScript and images and HTML here in a little while. That's going to be a lot of modules two and, uh, and three. But we also want to get down to the micro level. So if you want to go ahead and start talking a little bit about messaging, OData, and JSON, and start talking about message sizing and, and how to make all of that available. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got this uh, format called JSON. It's based on uh, JavaScript. In fact, it stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Um, it looks surprisingly similar to uh, JavaScript's Object Initializer syntax. There are some subtle differences, but um, it looks much the same. When um, a, a number of years ago, XML got extremely popular, and it's been used in a myriad of messaging formats and protocols. And, and XML is a very good standard, a very robust standard. It served its purpose well, and uh, it's still in heavy, heavy use today. But I would say that for modern applications, and certainly for mobile applications, the use of XML is easily declining, and yes. JSON is easily <laughs> increasing. XML is so verbose. It, it, it's really kind of funny when you put the JSON and the XML side by side. Yeah. It's, it's striking how verbose that XML right. is. Yeah. And we're actually going to put those side by side right now. And in fact, the second thing I want to talk about when it comes to message sizing is you can condition your message so that you're not only pulling back a, a message, some data from a web service perhaps, that is using a format that tends to be smaller, but you you can also put some thought into exactly what you're bringing back so that you're not bringing back columns and rows that you don't need coming down to the mobile device so that you don't have uh, multiple K messages when all you really need is just a little bit. So let's go ahead and take a look at both of those right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you first to the concept of OData and I'm going to do that by taking you out to odata.org. Now, OData, if you haven't heard of this before, it's a number of years old. It's a, it's a pretty mature standard. Um, it's actually an um, accepted standard from the uh, OASIS committee. So it is a, a good and public standard. And it's really exciting. I absolutely love OData. The easiest way, there's lots of documentation here on odata.org, lots of good uh, docs and also good uh, examples and getting started apps and stuff like that. The place on odata.org that I like to go is to the OData services so that I can glance at some sample services that are using OData as their messaging. And you notice on the top here that I have the different versions, so version three and version four. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you to version three of the Northwind database and I'm going to show you that compared to version 4. Now, before I do this, I want to take you to the home page of OData and show you a little tool that I found the other day called XOData, which is super groovy. I would call it super, I think it qualifies as super groovy. And that's, I, that's not an exaggeration. I would agree. All right. Uh, where is the actual URL to it? You I'll just it, go to it directly. This morning. I'll just go to it directly. And I go. noticed that it is case sensitive, which is odd. <clears throat> okay, so this is called XO data. And the, if you go to the preview, it allows you to go enter any URL that you want to an OData endpoint. So if somebody, including yourself, has created an OData 
endpoint, an OData service, you can just go enter the URL there and it'll, it's going to visualize it for you. It does also give you some um, samples, including these Northwind OData um, services that I'm talking about. So I'm just going to take you directly to the Northwind OData v3. It spins a little bit, it looks at the metadata for that service, pulls back that metadata, parses it, and then look at this. this is really nice. So it basically just created an ERM diagram for uh, uh, for that that OData source for that yeah. Northwind database. And because OData is a good data standard, mm -hmm. it's going to be able to do this for any OData service that's out there. Fantastic. Yeah. Now I can just glance at this and I can say, oh, look at this. I've got customers, and they've got a customer, or actually they don't have a customer name. They have a contact name. So that's an important distinction. So now I've I've grokked this service. I'm able to understand what it is that this service offers me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, open a tool that I love called Fiddler. If you don't have Fiddler, <laughs> you can go to fiddler2.com and download it. And uh, Fiddler, what does Fiddler do? Fiddler allows you to see what the chatter is on your machine. Okay. Shows you the HTTP chatter. So everything that's going up and everything that's coming back down. Yes. In fact, right now I have a filter on. I'm going to turn that filter off and then I'm going to go to a browser and just go to Bing. And then I'm going to go back to Fiddler, and you can see that Bing has a number of different, like there's the primary call right here, which comes back with 62K worth of, worth of uh, information. But then there are a number of other calls that are derivative on a call to Bing that, that it's going to follow up with. Okay? okay. So that's every single call that was being made um, uh, and they're from, still coming uh, from in. your browser on up. Okay. Uh, yeah, and it's, and it's everywhere on your machine, regardless of what's calling it. Okay. Now, I like to turn the filter on, and in this case, I'm filtering for anything I do locally on my machine. Let me go ahead and zoom in on that. Anything I do locally on my machine, that wasn't a zoom, I, I realized. Yeah, yeah, control one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, anything that happens on odata.org, because that's what I'm showing off, and anything that I do in Azure Mobile Services, because, spoiler alert, we're going to be looking at that later. <laughs> okay, so let me go ahead and clear this, and then I'm going to go back to the browser where I was showing you these services, and I'm going to go to the version 3 of Northwind, and I'm going to click on that. And look at what it comes back with. XML. All right? Now, mm -hmm. the Internet Explorer is inherently capable of rendering XML for me, and so it's going to show this to me. This is a, a version 3 metadata file for OData. Yep. Now let me hit back, and let me go to version 4, and then go to that Northwind service. And now, it doesn't show me XML. It comes back and says, hey, this is Jason. How do you want to view this? Internet Explorer is not capable inherently of showing JSON. It just asks you to open it. I'll go ahead and open that, and there it is. You can see that it's giving me my metadata in JSON format. Okay. So this is nice. I mean, we're, you know, we're getting more familiar with JSON, and it's easier for us as humans to read, so that's super handy. But that's the endpoint for that service. So I'm going to go to the V3, and I'm going to copy this endpoint, and then I'm going to go to my Fiddler, and you can see those calls that were made. And let's look at the, the first one that we called, the V3. Here's the V3 that we called, and it comes back with, you can see with, based on this, uh, based on this little icon here, you can see that this came back as XML. And if I double click on that, it opens for me over on the right. And this is showing me first the request, and then the response, basic HTTP concepts. If you want to learn about HTTP requests and responses, you can go uh, watch a video specifically on that topic, and you'll learn a whole lot about the way these, um, uh, the web protocol works. Now, Fiddler is being really nice in showing this to us in an easy-to-read format, but I like to click raw sometimes and just look at the raw messages. This is what actually went over the wire, okay? I said, hey, what about this service endpoint? And it came back with this right here. And you can see that this is XML. Let me scroll over a bit. This is all kinds of XML tags. Now, this is relatively large um, relative to the, uh, the JSON that I'm going to show you soon. Uh, this is 2,643 bytes, about 2.5 kilobytes. And that is because we're paying an angle, breaks, angle brace tax here in, okay. in XML. Now the JSON format, and by angle brace tax, what you mean is that it's it's got all of those 
bullpen and close elements and all yep. of that that isn't necessarily yep. needed. Okay. Exactly. To, to yep. basically convey the same amount of information, it has to give more information. Right. Okay. Yep. Okay, now when I called this in version 4, notice the URL is different. When I called this in version 4, it came back to me. Let me look at the raw. Mm -hmm. came back to me in JSON format, and so it's inherently a lot smaller. Now, this one is um, encoded, so I'm not going to go ahead and decode that at this point, but uh, it's, it's not exactly fair to directly compare these because uh, the version 4 address also limits the number of responses that, come back, that comes back. But mm -hmm. suffice to say, it's going to be a much smaller message, okay? Now, that's when... Um, I called it directly from the web page here. I just went here and clicked on it, and you saw that call. Now, I can actually take that URL. Let me take this XML. Actually, I'll start right with the JSON and drag it over here to my composer and drag it down into this panel, and it turns green, and that means I want re to reissue that request again, but I might want to customize it. So I'm going to drop it in there, and it just basically gives me that URL, writes out all my headers and stuff like that. So I'm ready to execute this again. Now I can call execute anytime I want, and it will execute this call. Very handy. So I'm going to execute that one again. And there we go, 634. There it is all broken out. There's my, uh, my JSON result. And mm -hmm. you can see that this is what's coming back. By the way, I can also tap R over here, and I can, I can call that as many times in a row as I want. Because this is coming back with so little information, it's super, super fast. That's kind of the whole point here. So uh, this is coming back with the entities and showing what, me what I have to work with. I can notice whenever I hit the root uh, endpoint of a OData service, I can look at these entities. I can grab one of those, like, for instance, customers. I can go back to my composer, and I can just add customers on there. And it's going to issue another call and pull back all of the customers. There we go. There's all the customers. And in fact, it's not all the customers. It's, it's paging for me. So it's uh, giving me a little metadata that says, here are the first few that I'm going to give you. And if you want to get the rest, here's a skip token. This is like a fully linked list here. Okay, now look at this message size, 2307. This is the size of the message that comes back with JSON. Pretty nice using JSON because it's nice and small. Mm -hmm. But let's refine that. Let's say that we're calling this list of customers, but instead of grabbing all this information about the customers and then only utilizing one field, mm -hmm. let's, through OData, very easily and descriptively say, I only want the contact name. I'm not interested in all the other fields here. So let's do that. It's nice and easy. In the URL itself, I just add a query string. You know that query strings always start with a question mark, and then subsequent parameters are delimited with ampersands. Mm -hmm. All of the OData verbs or terms begin with a cash, a dollar sign. Okay? So the one I'm going to choose is select. Do you so want to throw that in a notepad real quick just so we can see that a little easier? Yeah, and actually I'm going to zoom into it. Ah, there we go. That's perfect. And type it like that. Okay. So. This is because I'm typing a query string. Right. This is because OData terms take a dollar sign, and this is the OData term that I'm using right now. Just like a SQL statement. Just like a SQL statement, yep. Mm -hmm. and, and just like a SQL statement, what I'm doing here is I'm limiting my column set. So I'm narrowing my table. Let's say all I want is the contact name. Okay? Mm -hmm. Select equals contact name. Execute that. It comes back instead of... 2.3K, look at the size of this, 532 bytes. Nice, okay. Let's actually look at that message. I'll double click on it. You can see already in the JSON view that it's coming back with just that one field. Mm -hmm. And if I go to the raw, you can see why this thing is so tiny. Let me go ahead and transform this. You can see why this thing is so tiny because it's coming back with messages like, and that didn't work out as I intended, it's coming back with messages like this. Contact name and then the contact's name. Very, very small. And then I can also not just reduce the width of my table, that is in the column set of my table, but I can also go back in here to my composer and say not just the select term, do this again, not just the select term, I'm also, I need an ampersand, interested in filtering this. And when I filter, you can see that I'm, I'm having to use the equal sign for my standard HTML URL syntax, and so I can't reuse that in a predicate. So if I want to filter by country, for instance, I'm going to say country space 
Now Fiddler saying, wait, you can't put a space in the URL. So I need to put that space as a, an encoded space, percent 20. Space, EQ, that means equals. Yep. That's the syntax you have to use. Another space, and then single quote, Germany. All right. So that, that, uh, that percent 20 is that space in, in URL encoding. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, this is a, it's a little bit unfortunate that we have to do that, but it's understandable. That's just the way uh, HTTP works. Okay? Yep. Can't pass those spaces. I do kind of wish that Fiddler would take care of that for me. But, you know, can't ask. <laughs> yeah, and there's probably a way to do that. Yeah. And I just don't know about it. Okay, so bam, let's get that. Now instead of 532 bytes, I have successfully retrieved a message and it's only 363 bytes because this is only the contacts that live in Germany and it's only their contact name. Nice. And what I really like about what you did there is in a lot of ways you followed best practices for just querying a database. Yeah. That ask for what you want and nothing else. That way you're limiting the amount of data that's coming back from the database. Same exact concept here, but obviously a lot more important since we're talking about a lot less bandwidth. Uh, ask for what you want, and that's it. Yep. That's fantastic. That's good cool. advice. Yeah. All right. Cool. Let's see. Where was I? Where I were had, you? Where was I? Right here. You've been here all along. <laughs> I've been here all along. Okay, there we go. Um, so a couple of uh, last little resources just to um, dovetail off of what uh, Jeremy just, uh, just demoed there as far as uh, finding out uh, a bit more information about developing for mobile, about using Azure, about uh, OData. You can go ahead and check out those, uh, those URLs right there. Cool. Now, there's an old set. An old saying, back from the C++ days. Ooh, that's a long time ago. I know. Um, although a lot of people still develop in C++. So I guess <laughs> a I lot say, of people. Yeah. So, but in any event, um, there's an old saying that goes, don't outsmart the compiler. Basically meaning don't write code to try to trick the compiler into doing something that you think is going to be better performant. Because chances are the compiler would have done it anyway. Or you've actually tricked the compiler into doing the wrong thing, or you wrote this really obscure bit of code that nobody can understand that's getting you essentially no true benefit. Don't outsmart the compiler. And I, I really like to use that philosophy almost everywhere. Don't outsmart the environment that you're in. Or to bring that into our mobile environment, don't outsmart the device. That one of the keys to trying to develop an app in general, and we'll spin this forward into a mobile web app as well, is we want to make it look like it's been there all along. So one of the things that you can do in JavaScript or in CSS is you can create your own little custom drop downs and things like that. Don't. Because A, you're probably not going to add a whole lot extra to your site but also B, now you're changing the interface that the user is used to. And finally C, you're asking the, user, the, the device to do more than it, than, than, than it needs to. So when it comes to things like drop-down boxes, when it comes to things like text boxes, don't try to outsmart the device. Let the device use its defaults and go from there. Now the next big thing to keep in mind when we're talking about smaller devices, see what I did there, big thing, small device, see, see, I'm clever. Thank you, thank you. I'm here all week, try the veal. Um, no, the next big thing to, to think about when you're dealing with a small device is that paging is really an awkward mechanism to go through a long set of data. Because one of the things that needs to happen quite frequently is I need to be able to go backwards. And on a desktop device, that's relatively easy, especially because of the fact that I can show more pages. But on a mobile device, that's really not an easy interface. So instead of doing paging, scroll instead. So go with a single column, and then either A, with a little bit of JavaScript, or B, maybe just kind of cheat and add in a button that says load more. When the user gets down to the bottom, load up the next bit of data. Load up the next bit of data. Load up the next bit of data. 
How do you like that experience when you're using the, the kind of the infinite scroll list on a mobile device? Does that, does that feel like a good experience For to you? me, that feels like a good experience. What about the difference between the scroll list just kind of automatically bringing in new content versus the uh, hold up to load more versus the load more button? Okay, so we've got sort of three things. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so let's talk about the, the that that infinite scroll versus the the load more down at the very bottom. And personally, I like the load more button. Um, and I know that it's not quite as as cool necessarily as I reach the bottom and ooh look more data ooh piece of candy ooh piece of candy um, that I'm not just simply seeing over and over again more and more data that I'm having to hit that load more but what I like about it is it gives me a bit more control over when I actually want to load more data but also B a lot of times sites will put you know maybe like the contact us or, or other information like that down there at the very bottom and so if it's that infinite scroll it makes it very hard for me to get to those little buttons at the bottom. So personally, I like the load more, but that's just me. I don't know if you have a preference one way or another. Yeah, there. it's hard to say. I think there are different times when one works better over another. I'm not sure yeah. how I feel about uh, the having to drag up and hold for a second and then let go in order to trigger it to load more because it takes a little while to yeah. figure out how that mechanism works. Exactly, and I've, I've also found a lot of times that, again, depending on the device, that doesn't always seem to, to connect as well as it should. Yeah, that right. the, the, the device doesn't always pick up on that. Um, and plus, you know, if you have a button there, from a developer standpoint, that's also easier for me to implement. Oh, sure. You know, yeah. that just on click, you know, load next data. So I, I personally like that, but a, again, everybody's sort of different there. Yeah. Yeah. I, if, I think that if your data set is small enough mm -hmm. and you can, because you can, you can basically load some more whenever the user brings a certain um, scroll position into view, so maybe when they get three mm -hmm. quarters of the way down the list, you can be going behind the scenes and yep. loading more, yeah, and and bringing it in. And if you can, if your data set is such that that can be a performant and yep. a fluid operation, then I like that the best. You can just kind of keep on scrolling. Yeah. Yep. But if your data set is large, you've got big images, it's taken a while to render it, it's not virtualized, then I think you're you're going to be better off doing explicit, like you said. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that completely. Yep. Yeah. So, and one of the things that you'll notice there, and, and 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 this is something that you'll hear quite a bit today, is that there's not necessarily one right answer. Right. You know that that infinite scroll versus the the load more button. You know, again, it's it's all based on on your data, and it's based on on your preferences and and the preferences of your users. That there isn't necessarily a right or a wrong way. Now, Jeremy brought up a very big point about uh, data sets and and loading data up, and. One of the, uh, the phrases that I always like is perception is reality, that how a user perceives something is what their reality is. In turn, four seconds. That's all you're going to get is four seconds for your page to fully load and render. If it goes beyond that, if it doesn't render in that four second window, your user's going to think your page is slow, even if it's not. I remember reading... Um, a study from quite a while ago that had the exact same app, one that had a lot of uh, glitz and glamour, a lot of, you know, bells and whistles, and another one that was very plain. And they both had the exact same feature set and the exact same bugs. So they were the same app. But everybody was willing to give a lot more forgiveness and rate the app that looked better as the better app, even though they had the exact same problems. Why? Because that was their perception. If your site doesn't load in four seconds, or better yet, three, or better yet, two. And unfortunately for <laughs> us as web developers, this number has been going yeah. down over the years as people's attention spans yeah. have been going down. It's, it's remarkable. I mentioned earlier, you know, my, my Commodore 64, I remember the good old days of grabbing, you know, the floppy disk, sticking it into the drive, saying, um, what was it, load um, dollar comma eight comma one? I think that's right. Somebody in the QA uh, will, will, will correct me. But I'm pretty sure it's load dollar comma eight comma one. Doing that and then walking away. And like, you know, go to grab you a make soda. A sandwich, yeah. yeah, exactly. And then come back and then maybe my copy of Hardball would finally be, be loaded up and then I could go ahead and, uh, and start playing well, away. It's nice when you launch something that you can walk away from. It's yeah. the times when you've got to swap the <laughs> floppy disks. The yeah. attended boot. <laughs> We're really showing our age here. Right. Um, but it is kind of funny to think, you know, that was our, our acceptable user experience back then. But now you're absolutely right that people are just expecting it instantaneously. And it's, it's really funny because we're expecting 
expecting so much more, but we're expecting it to happen so much faster. So how can we then make our applications go faster? Well, let's start here. And I'm not going to kick all the way back to the slide, but I'm going to kind of refresh everybody's memory. What was rule one? Keep it simple. The silly. simpler, silly, yes. The simpler that you keep your site, the easier it's going to be for the device to load and render it. The simpler the site, the better performance it's going to be. Now, the next thing is limit what it is that you're trying to do. So limit the amount of JavaScript processing that you're going to be doing. Because those complex scripts can bring your page to a screeching halt, can cause it to refresh. And I also want to highlight kind of real quickly here, consider <laughs> avoiding common libraries. And there's really two reasons to do this. That number one is just to simply avoid taking that dependency. Because when you start taking dependencies on another library and on another library on another, on another library, if something revs, now all of a sudden that can have a cascading effect elsewhere. So just from a good design perspective, you want to consider those very carefully. But also number two is that, yeah, jQuery isn't necessarily that big, and yeah, Bootstrap isn't necessarily that big, but after a little while, you keep saying, well, it's not that big, it's not that big, it's not that big, and then you've got all of these little things that weren't that big individually that are now much bigger than you really want them to be in the end. So consider very carefully whether or not you actually need jQuery, whether or not you actually need Bootstrap. And I love both of those. I love both of them, but consider very carefully whether or not you need them. And for a lot of libraries, you yeah. can think about the fact that you can um, oftentimes consume them, consume them modularly. Yes. So it might be a large library, but you can just take pieces of it. I know with jQuery, I don't remember how it works um, right now, but you used to be able to go build the exact version of jQuery that you want mm -hmm. and just take what you want, and then you have an actual file. And then with, with most of the libraries, what we're going to is the AMD pattern where we're, we're consuming just the modules of that library that we want. Yeah, Bootstrap will actually let you do that as well, that you can go in and choose the individual components of Bootstrap that you want. And you'll even notice with Bootstrap, with a lot of the different um, JavaScript files, that you can go grab the individual JavaScript file or you can go grab the, uh, the entire thing. Um, and also, it's worth highlighting Micro.js, which is a great little site here. Let me, I'm going to bring up my, uh, my browser here. Uh, I want, um, I want to get out of my, and there we go. Okay, cool. So let's go in and uh, Micro.js.com. Perfect. Uh-oh. MicroJS.com. Uh, yeah, it, it can't have the www on it. Oh, it's bizarre. Okay, all right, there you go. But in any event, uh, MicroJS, sort of as the name would imply, is a whole bunch of very, very, very small scripts that do something very simple. So, for example, if you wanted something that was going to parse out, let's say, regular expressions. There you go. There's a little script that will parse out regular expressions. That, that's a little bit big at 3K. Um, but in any event, you know, regular expressions. Or, for example, let's say we want to start playing around with, uh, with touch. Then you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of little scripts that will give you something with touch. So if you want um, swipe, if you want something that's going to, I'm um, just kind of looking around at, uh, at other ones, um, add touch event support to, uh, to desktop and other mouse-based browsers. There you go. And it's a very tiny, small little script. And a lot of times that's all that you need. So rather than taking the dependency on jQuery and writing it all on your own, go grab one of these little libraries and just use one of these instead. So that way, again, you're not taking that dependency and you're also going to keep things going as fast as possible. All right, let me go back to my slides here. I want... All right. Next thing, depend on CSS. We're going to talk about media queries in the next module, but media queries are your friend because they're going to give you the ability to target different devices without having to use scripts. The more code that you put into 
an application. The more processing the device has to do, the slower it's going to be. Depend on CSS whenever possible, as opposed to doing it with JavaScript. Try to streamline everything. One of the big things that we'll be talking about in the next module is images. Don't do this. Don't just simply say style equals width colon 200 pixels. Will that resize the image? Well, it'll resize the display of the image, but it won't actually resize the entire image for you. Um, bundling and minification, I'm going to come back to in a second. I really want to highlight CDNs, content um, uh, delivery networks. The big thing about a CDN, first of all, is it's going to make your site overall faster, less requests coming into your site. But also more importantly, is it's going to increase the possibility that they've already got it in cache. That way they're not even having to download it. And then last but not least is bundling. You know, I haven't done a demo yet. I, I, I want to do a demo. Um, I want Visual Studio. Do, 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 do. And I'm just going to say file new. Um, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I want to open up my demos. I'll just put them all into my demos. There we go. And uh, let's uh, right click, add new project. And I'm just going to create a very simple um, MVC app. So this is going to be my uh, bundling uh, demo here. And then uh, we'll just go with MVC and we'll hit OK. And, and you said host in the cloud, oh, so you can. You're right, I did. Yeah. Oh, OK. There you go. We'll give that a second. <laughs> <laughs> Problem solved. OK. Now, one of the big things to keep in mind about downloading um, into a browser is that you're going to be limited on the number of connections, somewhere between four and six, depending on, uh, on the browser. And where this really poses a problem is when you're sending down a whole bunch of files. So you're sending down six images, you're sending down five CSS files, and you're sending down, down two JavaScript files. And one of the biggest things that's going to slow things down is trying to manage all of those different connections. This is where bundling comes into play. So that if I open up my little layout page, what you're going to notice right inside of here is our little bundles. And they're already baked in. So it's going to send down jQuery. It's going to send down Bootstrap. And what's going to happen on the server side is that it's going to send all of those files down that have been added into a bundle in one shot. And it will also automatically minimize them for me, meaning that it's going to strip out the different white space and so forth. That's important for us as humans, but completely irrelevant to browsers. So if I do a real quick control F5 here, pause, or maybe not a real quick <laughs> control F5. There we go. Slow control F5. <laughs> All right. And while that's coming up in the background here, somebody somewhere had to warm up a server for you. Exactly. <laughs> um, in any event, um, so. Right here um, is uh, my F12 tools, and down below is, is my little network, so we can see everything that's going to be coming down. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit refresh, and you'll notice that all of those different little files are coming down in one shot. So rather than it's sending down our different Bootstrap and Respond.js, it's sending them all down in one bundle inside of here, so you can see the bundles that are coming down. And inside of those bundles is going to be all of those different scripts. So coming down in one connection, rather than needing one connection for that jQuery file and one connection for that jQuery file and one connection for that jQuery file. So they're coming down in those bundles. And you can actually go in and create your own bundles give them names, and then go ahead and send them down on your own. It's actually a very simple uh, bit of uh, UI there. And then now you're depending on the server to help you out a bit there. OK. Cool, cool, cool. Back to my uh, little slides. The last big thing that I want to mention on the good side is focus 
on what's important. That if we take a look at Fred Knott here, image from uh, Wikipedia there, this might be a good desktop site. Because over on the left, I've got the image. Bottom left, I've got the instruction. Over on the right, I've got the name of the knot. And then a little bit of, in my case, Lauren Mipsum, but a description on what the knot could be used for. Okay. All of that makes sense. But, you know, if I'm looking at this on a mobile site, I'm not going to have this much space. So again, we want to focus in on what's important. Well, what's important? Well, the name of the knot's important. The image is important. And the instructions are important. So when you start designing your site, when you start thinking about mobile, focus in on what's important and put that right up at the very top. So that way everybody sees that right away. Now we'd be remiss if we didn't mention one last time the fact that we've got device after device after device. And granted, yes, as time has gone on, browsers have gotten better about conforming to standards they have, but not always perfect. Emulators help, but you've got to test, test, test. I actually have a friend of mine um, who's, uh, who's a web developer, I, and I greatly respect him, um, but he takes this, I think, almost a little too far, but I got to respect him for it, is he actually has a, a device for everything that he's going to support. So basically, you name the particular um, Android or, or Windows device that, that he's going to support, and he's got one of those devices. So that way, he can go ahead and fire it up and see how it looks inside the actual device. Might be a little bit far. Emulators are certainly your, uh, your friend there. All right. Now let's have a little fun. What not to do? Let's start with don't use plugins. Just don't, period, end of sentence. Because again, you never know what device is gonna support a plugin or not. Last little thing, little website here that will show you all sorts of kind of bad things on a mobile device. And I'm just kind of scrolling through this really quickly and I'll let you guys go in and kind of peruse that a little bit later on on, uh, on your own but it's all the different things that you really shouldn't do um, inside of um, one of the, uh, one of the themes sites. that I saw browsing through those was yeah. don't tell people, um, hey, you just basically need to go get a desktop machine. Yeah, exactly. Why yeah. do you even have a site there? Yeah, that's, and that's, that's a great point. Yeah, if you're just gonna say, hey, go get a bigger browser, why are you doing that in the first place? Just show them the desktop version. Yeah, exactly, be done with it. Okay. That was a fair amount of material. Yeah, that was a lot. Yeah. What do you say we take 10 minutes? Sure. All right. Let's take 10 minutes, and then uh, when we come back, we're going to start digging in a little bit deeper into the tools that, uh, that you're going to need, and we'll start to uh, focus in on designing for our, uh, for our mobile sites. So uh, what do you say we, uh, we take 10, and then we'll, uh, we'll come on back. And you take 10, too. Yes. See you soon. <laughs>